everyone. This is Anne and welcome back to my combined floss tube and knitting Wooly Wonka fibers channel. Today is May 28th, I think. Monday, May 28th. So it is Memorial Day here in the United States. Um, if you are someone here in the States, I hope you're lucky enough to have today off and are celebrating and maybe doing a cookout and remembering those folks who um, gave their lives in the military for our country. Um, there's lots of moaning growing, going on in my little space right now. Um, we had a big morning here, got up late for us about quarter of six and went out and did um, a quick, semi-quick four mile run and um, so now certain dog friends are having a huge nap. Um, if you're new to the channel, welcome and thank you for choosing to check me out. If you are returning, as always, thank you so much for opting to spend some of your um, video watching time with me. Um, I'm gonna be doing another combo video. Uh, last, two weeks ago, the last video I filmed, that seemed to work out really great, so I decided that is my format going forward. Again, I will put timestamps down below so that if you're not interested in a certain section, you can skip to the sections that you are interested in. Um, let's see. You can find me on the web. Um, I actually have two Instagram accounts, one for business, which is Willy Wonka Fibers, and my stitching slash private uh, life type account is over at Little Bird Stitcher. Um, if you're interested in my website, it is WillyWonkaFiber.com. I also have a Ravelry group and a Facebook page, both Willy Wonka Fibers. And you all excuse me because I'm still horrifically uh, allergy filled, uh, especially after spending some time outside this weekend. Um, so let's do a life update quickly, semi quickly. Um, this past weekend, if you follow me on Instagram, you probably saw a few photos that I took. Uh, I went to volunteer at the Caja del Rio Endurance Ride which is outside of Santa Fe proper. It's at the Santa Fe Equestrian Center. That's where base camp was. Um, in honor, I'm wearing one of my competition t-shirts. Uh, I think I think this was the last year I rode Fort Stanton. Um, it's a, one of the rides out in the eastern part of the state. And it's usually in the summer and it's usually stinking hot. So anyway, this is my commemorative t-shirt from that particular event um, when I still had horses. So for those of you who aren't horsey, I'm just going to give you a really quick kind of overview of things just for your edification. Um, the American Endurance Riders Conference is uh, the governing body and they sponsor rides all throughout the United States. Rides have to be sanctioned, meaning the ride manager has some paperwork to do Make sure your permits are up to date. You can't just sort of go out and do whatever. Um, there's usually two and sometimes three and sometimes four or five uh, distances at the rides. Um, a limited distance ride, which is kind of a great beginner type ride, is 25 miles. They're 50 milers, 75 milers, 100 milers. Um, the big 100 miler, if you have any interest in Googling it, is called the Tevis or the Western States Ride. It's um, every year in July over the weekend closest to the full moon um, because it's 100 miler, so you have 24 hours to complete, which means a lot of the riders ride it, at least part of it, if not a lot of it, in the dark. Uh, super, super, super challenging ride, um, as you would guess, as it's like a national championship, right? You want to have the best of the best. The ride that was held this weekend had a 25, which is technically limited distance, and a 50 mile. And then they also did a 12 mile fun loop. And added to this, which is not necessarily the case for all endurance rides, was a marathon. Um, one of the loops was the same length as a marathon course, 24.6 miles, I think it is. So there were also human runners out. Um, so there's different 
start times depending on how long you're riding. Um, 50, mile, 50 milers have um, two vet checks in the middle of their loops, like they'll go out for this ride. They did a 22 mile loop, I think it was, and then a 20 mile loop, and then an eight mile loop. It's broken up different at all the rides. It really just depends on the terrain and where you can go. This particular ride, the vet checks were in camp, which is a much easier logistics kind of thing. Um, when the vet checks are out, the riders have to pack food for themselves and the horses that has to go in a bag that goes into a trailer and then has to get hauled out to the out check. And you always have to have two vets because you've got people coming in at such different times. Um, if you've seen the movie Hidalgo, that's kind of a Hollywood version of this. Um, let me say that the main point of all of this is the safety of the horse and that the horse is finished in great shape. You, you don't want people pushing their horses to the limit. Um, humans are on your own and frankly, you know, most people look pretty rough when they get off their horse after 50 miles. Uh, you know, not going to, not going to lie there. Um, and actually a lot of people look pretty rough getting off their horse after 25 miles. Um, so I went down to help the vets out. Um, they do check-ins on the, the night before. So I went from two to five and we did all of that. The vets, um, they ha we have a checklist on a card. It's stuff like capillary refill, um, checking for dehydration, checking for muscle tone, checking for any cuts, sores, scrapes, swellings, um, sensitive parts, either in their legs or in their back where the saddle would fit. Um, making sure their gait is on, that they're not favoring anything or limping, checking what their resting pulse rate is. So the, that particular check happens at the very beginning of the rides and at the very end of the rides. And then, like I said, for the 50s, it happens two times in the middle. And for the 25s, it would happen one time in the middle. Um, and the vets are very good about saying, hey, look, this is not a problem yet but I need you to go to your, wherever your horse is being um, tacked up and they need to get some food and water into them. Or, um, you know, that looks a little bad, that, look, that leg looks a little stiff. Why don't you walk them around, see if it loosens up a little bit. It might just be a muscle cramp, get some water in them. Um, you know, electrolyte them if you can, whatever basic treatment is, and then come back and check in with me before you go back out on the trail. Um, and you know, the conditions outside make a huge difference. It was fairly warm on Saturday, although not as warm as it was yesterday. I didn't help on yes yesterday on Sunday, but on Saturday it was warm enough that there were some horses who, um, needed to have drunk more on the trail. Their gut sounds were kind of quiet and a little slow. And one of the easiest, fastest ways for the vets to check and see if a horse is doing okay is something called a cardiac recovery index. So they will send them out on a short trot. The rider trots alongside the horse. They turn around and come back to the vet. The vet's taken their resting pulse where they've kind of come in and calmed down and gotten a baseline. They send them out to do that quick trot and back. If the heart rate spikes too high, the vet knows that there's something going on there that's probably metabolic and probably not so good. Um, the ride actually went really pretty well. Um, they had, I think, six pulls, uh, meaning that they the vets had six horses that they did not judge as fit to continue, um, four of which were muscular. And some of the horses had been trailered in from areas that it was fairly flat. And this ride is fairly rocky and fairly hilly. So a lot of back leg stuff, which sometimes shows up when you have a horse who's not used to having to dig with their hind legs to go uphill um, or sometimes coming downhill too fast they'll get like a, the equivalent of a hamstring pull. Um, they had one horse who kudos to his rider the horse came in fine he came into the vet check fine and they went to you know they went and got water and stuff and 
the writer brought him back over and said to Doc, can you check him before he goes out? I don't think he's right. And as the horse was standing there, you could see he was starting to colic. Um, like just in that little bit of time. Um, so part of the challenge for the vets, and I guess I should say they that horse got pulled. If the vets have to give any treatment to the horse, um, any injection, any you know, any inflammatory painkiller, if they have to put fluids in them, any of those things, the horse does not continue. End of the discussion, no argument, period. It's the vet's call. Um, <clears throat> it's a challenge for the vets because they constantly have people coming in and going out that need to be checked. And at the same time, then they're kind of having to do like triage and potential uh, issue treatments, um, you know, and... Most of the riders, again, you know, they know their horses really well. They do a great job of keeping up with a lot of that stuff. But it's still, it's just like the amount of crazy stuff going on can be a little overwhelming. So anyway, um, it was a lot of fun. I thought maybe it would be a little more bittersweet for me since uh, it's been about five years since I've ridden and no longer have my horses. Um, but yeah, I was tired enough just standing around vet, do, dealing with the vets. And I was glad I didn't ride. So no horse in the stable for me today, although I did fall in love with this gorgeous five-year-old stallion. Man, he was, his owner had completely blown out her ACL. And as a result, when the vets were going to have her trot her horse out, just even at the preliminaries, um, she kind of looked at them and she said, well, do you have anyone who can trot him out for us, for me? And I was like, I'll, yeah, I'll do it. I've done it before. It's not a big deal. Just tell me what I need to know about him. Um, super, super well-behaved horse. Absolutely beautiful. Um, probably bigger than I would want to ride. He was pretty leggy for an Arabian, um, but so polite. And he just trotted out nicely with me, slowed down when I asked him to, turned around and came back. So I did all of Tammy's trot outs for her, which was kind of fun. Um, because I also didn't have to ride the 50 miles she rode with um, her knee. I can't even imagine. I don't, even, And I don't even know how she got on him. Um, anyway, so that was fun. And we'll get moving along here to stitching stuff because we're 12 minutes in. So um, let's talk about knitting. Um, the spring issue of Knit Filament is live. I'll put a link to that below. All the patterns are available either as ebook or print. Um... I have a new pattern that rele that will release tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. It's called the Aspen Cowlette. It is a hybrid shawl cowl pattern. It is uh, got some basic lace in it, and it takes one skein of fingering weight yarn. I'm gonna try to insert some photos here. Of that pattern um, and I will pop a link to the Ravelry pattern page below as well. The sample was knit in my Nimiwi sock which is the 5050 silk uh, superwash merino fingering weight in the colorway Dryad and if you would like a kit those are also available at the Yarn Guys and I will link them below. Um, I am still working away on all of the Santa Fe collection pieces. I have just the upper part of the sleeve to do of sleeve one on the jacket I'm working on, and then I'm hoping to blast through sleeve number two so I can send the sample off to be in the TNNA fashion show, which is the National Needle Arts, I think that's what they are, um, kind of trade show that is in June. Um, so none of that to show you. Sorry guys, like I said, it's gonna be boring for a while. Um, if you're keeping up with the Willy Wonka Palooza topics, uh, the prompts for June are going to be anything with blue for a colorway or socks. I thought socks would be a great one to use in June because I know a lot of folks go on vacation and it's the end of school and graduation and portable projects just sound really good to me at this at this point. So I do have a project that I may pull out to work on that's just, it's um, 
self-striping sock yarn and it's um, I'll just do it as like a plain vanilla sock pattern but um, stay tuned on that uh, otherwise not much else going on in the world of knitting um, again if you're interested in either any of my sock patterns or yarns that have blue in them I have a list of both of those things in my Ravelry group in the June Wonka Palooza thread there is a coupon code for 20% off both patterns and uh, yarn doesn't have to be sock yarn but yarn um, that fit those categories and so um, if you want to check that out I'll link to it below um, and you can take advantage of that sale for June I will have upcoming tidbits on um, the Tour de Fleece, which kicks off in July, but I'll talk about that more in my next video, which will be once June has officially started as we're kind of gearing up. I will have a Tour de Fleece team again this year, so if you're a spinner and want to come hang out with us, we would love to have you. Which brings us to spinning. <clears throat> okay, so I finished up the fin. I don't think I showed you guys this last time. Maybe I did and I'm hallucinating. Okay, if you've seen this, you can be excited with me all over again. If you haven't, here it is. It is a two-ply, worsted weight, super squishy yarn. Um, 172, 178 yards and 3.2 ounces. I did not get the two halves of the roving divided up evenly so I had some left over on one bobbin which I just ditched because there's plenty in here to make a hat or a pair of mittens so um, the colorway is Stuart named after John Stewart of the Daily Show uh, from the no longer in business dyer funky Carolina but I love this I think it is a great guy colorway um, nice neutral without being totally boring so love that and I love spinning fin it's it's just it's squishy and it's soft but it's not as soft as merino so it holds up really nicely to lots of different projects so that is that finished and I am currently working on a blue face luster 100% blue face luster roving from Ocean Wind Knits this was one of the club fibers from I think it was 2017 but hang on let me look at the little card yep March 2017 and it was inspired by this photo of Quebec of a street in Quebec Lori who's the dyer behind this and Ocean Wind Knits is in Canada so this was part of her O Canada club And I am almost done spinning the singles on this. This is all I have left of the roving, but you can see that. It's a lot of really pretty earth tones, a little bit of blue green, but some chestnut and some kind of olive and herb greens blended in there. I think it's gonna be kind of a heathered yarn when I'm done plying it. So this is the first bobbin worth of the singles, spinning this. Um, for like a fingering to sport weight and the second bobbin of singles I have to finish up it's still on my wheel so once I'm done with that I will ply the two of those together and then that one will be done and out of fiber stash and into yarn stash um, not sure what's going on the wheel next but it will probably be something for the blue prompt for the Wonka Palooza in June just haven't decided what that is yet I have a lot of options on that one because excuse me I am a blue fan um, okay talked about that uh, let's talk about books next I have several to talk about <clears throat> the first one that I read over this last two weeks is a book called the Earl of Brass the artist or author's name is Kara Jorgensen so this is the first in, I don't think it's exactly a series, but she has a group where she um, is has characters inhabiting the same steampunkery world and 
so the stories are kind of linked even though they're not like parts one two and three of a story or something like that um I really liked how this book started out it was very clever it was very interesting it had good a really good heroine um the main plot is there is a young nobleman who is an explorer and he's in this horrible dirigible accident and he loses part of his arm and he wants to have a decent prosthesis made and the heroine is a maker of clockwork automatons like toys for kids um but she's been experimenting with a whole bunch of like articulated joints and how all those things go together so some really interesting science in the beginning of the book and the concept of this arm that she creates for him is really cool and then the book becomes something very different and they like go off and explore they're um like in the desert sort of a la uh carter's opening of the Tut tutankhamun tomb um and then it gets weirder and then there's like some weird socialist marxist stuff thrown in there and then bad things happen and then they wind up back in england <laughs> so this book was a little too bipolar for my taste because i really had a hard time wrapping my head around all the stuff that they start doing and there seems like there was sort of an agenda and there's like almost two books like two short stories that the author had and then maybe somebody said neither of these are good enough as short stories you should write a whole book so she just put them together very uneven um it was a debut novel it was okay um like i said really invested in the first portion of it kind of lost me halfway through so buyer beware maybe a c um the next book i read was a book called a promise of fire and the author's name is amanda boucher i suspect just how she says it or bouchette um so this falls firmly into the fantasy realm the main character when the story opens is hiding out um as part of a troop of traveling entertainers she reads cards to tell people's fortunes, but she's got all these other powers that she's kind of keeping tamped down. Um, and it's vaguely based with some Greek mythology behind it, um, but it's kind of woven into a different fantasy story. So there's some references to some of the Greek gods and sort of some of the Greek epic tales um but it's not a retelling a specific of any specific god or goddess um good character development really fun story um i got engaged with it i zipped through this book i guess if i had a complaint about it is i think it got a little bogged down in the sexual tension moments of like waiting for the two main characters relationship to progress there's a lot of like on again off again is it happening is she not into him you know just that the magic part of it was fun the characters the supporting character development was really good um i think overall a good read um just a little I don't know there were some parts that i skimmed through because i was like wow yeah you know what i kind of i get i get it there's this sexual tension and we need to just advance the story here a little bit um it is also book one of i think a trilogy and you know how i feel about those where the author kind of ends them and then there's like a whole you know there's a whole other story to get you to closure there's mini closure but not uh it's not like full blown. I think you have to read at least book two and probably book three to get the full character arc of our hero and heroine. Um, so that does bother me. I, so points off for that. Um, the last book, and I can't believe I didn't write down the author's name, but I'll include it when I link it below, is a book called An Enchantment of Ravens. I read this book for my around the year and 52 books prompt. 
about the prompt was find a book that a friend of yours on Goodreads has rated five stars. So I did. That's what this book was. Whatever you are doing now, including watching this video, stop what you're doing. Go and find this book at your library, on your Kindle, on your Nook, whatever. Whatever you have to do to get your hands on this book. If you like fantasy as a genre at all, go and get this. This book is amazing. Um, the imagery, the characters, the storyline is great. I can even say, and I do think it's technically a young adult fiction, I would recommend it for someone who's probably, I don't know, 14 or older. Um, there is sort of a undercurrent of romance, but there's nothing graphic or gratuitous in it. Um, there's not really a lot of violence, and most of it's sort of magical violence. Um, the main character is a young woman who lives in the town of Whimsy. Whimsy is always in summer. Every day is summer. Every day is the same in Whimsy. Because the, um, the town is basically governed by, that's not the right word, influenced by the Summerland Court of Fairy. So every day has nice weather and the weed is always growing and the grasshoppers are always singing. And everybody who lives in Whimsy is a human. And the reason that they're in Whimsy is because there's a human with a particular art that they can do. Whether it's writing or dressmaking or their chefs. Um, our main character is a painter. So she paints... Um, members of the fairy court or courtiers of the fairy court. Um, the fairies are unable to do craft, which is what they call it with a capital C. And the craft is any of these amazing things that the humans can do. Um, the fairies have no skill for it. And even indeed, if they tried to, it basically burns them. Like if they were to try to cook a stew. Uh, every time they would touch the pot, it would be on fire. If they tried to paint a portrait, the paintbrush handle would, would feel like they were holding a hot poker. So there's this interplay of the fairy realm and this smaller group of humans who, it's sort of a symbiotic relationship where neither one, neither group can kind of get rid of the other. Um, the main character, like I said, is a painter. Uh, she lives with her aunt. She's an orphan. Uh, and her two adopted younger sisters. If you read the book, you'll find out a little bit more about March and May. Um, and into the story steps the Autumn Prince, who wants to have his portrait painted. And it doesn't exactly go as planned. And uh, while she does complete his painting, um, she winds up offending him and he comes to basically exact um, revenge for her creating this portrait of him that he feels is not a true likeness of him. Uh, again, I have probably 12 or 15 bookmarks in my Kindle copy where I just found the writing so beautiful and the descriptions so amazing of the things that were going on, um, the way the fairy court looks, the different um, lands that the heroine walks through with the autumn prince because there's summer land and then there's the winter court and there's spring and then there's also the autumn court. Um, and as they go on this trek from summer land, which is, contains whimsy where she lives to the autumn prince's realm um, they pass through different areas and something's not quite right in the land of fairy um, just I'll give this one there was nothing about this book I didn't like even though it is part of a series she actually ended it in a way that you could read this as a complete standalone so two thumbs up on that um, like I said plot world building, character building, descriptive language, all of that in this book, 
loved it. Absolutely fantastic. So in a weird kind of scary, scary way, I had to not let myself read parts of this book simply because um, I didn't want it to end. Sorry, I got distracted by my phone texting me, but um, I, I, I didn't want to come to the end of this book so much so that I like couldn't bear to continue reading it at certain points. I just had to set it down. Um, I know that sounds completely bizarre, but that's how I felt about it. So definitely we'll pick up others in this series. I want some time to digest this. Um, I already know that it's going as I've, I've already started some brainstorming for some ideas about how to incorporate the word pictures into some knitwear designs. So that's where I go with a lot of that stuff. Um, yeah, so two thumbs up, five stars, A, whatever you want to give it. That's what I gave this book. Um, I have one book to start this week uh, called Where the Past Begins, um, which is sort of a memoir by the author Amy Tan, who wrote The Joy Luck Club. And it just seemed like an interesting kind of read. And I think it was on sale for like 99 cents or something like that through one of my list serves. So I went ahead and did pick that up. Um, I haven't started it yet, so I don't have any like real feedback on it, but I'll let you guys know as I get through that. Um, and then the other thing just to mention is that I have started reading um, Julia Cameron's book, The Artist's Way, which was kind of a seminal book in terms of what it was trying to present when it first came out. And I believe it, it, it either this year or in the last year or so has hit a 25th anniversary mark. So um, I had flipped through parts of it, but I'd never really read it as a whole and kind of worked through it. But there's a lot of prompts in it that fall into the journaling practice that I'm trying to incorporate into my mornings. So I decided I would go ahead and work through a lot of uh, work through the book. A lot of the prompts, especially in the first week, if, if you read this or worked through it, you'll probably know what I'm talking about. Aren't I'm not finding them very helpful for me, but I am interested to see the arc of this book. Um, from start to finish. If you're somebody who's read it or has worked through one of her workbooks, which I know are supporting um, pieces for the text that's in The Artist's Way, and you have any thoughts or feelings or just feedback about how, whether you thought it was helpful to you or not, um, I'd love it if you'd leave a comment, maybe have a dialogue about that. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm on the fence a little bit about it, but I've only finished week one, so I have no clear view on whether week two, it starts to kind of change in tone or not. Anyway, so I guess we can count that as another book that I'm currently reading since I am reading my way through it. Um, okay, so let's move on to Cross Stitch. So this um, month, I showed you earlier my finished um Bowl full of scaries. I finished that at the beginning of May. That was originally going to be my monogamous May piece, but I finished it in five days. So there you go. Um, the next thing I worked on was a stitching shelf. And I'm very happy to say that I have a page finish. I think this is like page one and this is page two. Um, and this is um, like the spring themed shelf. So I have been working on that for the full coverage fanatics spring stitch along. So still loving working on this piece. The colors, ah, uh, the colors are amazing. Um, and I am happy that I finally started this book. It just, this door was a little bit fiddly with all these small, there was a lot of confetti in here. There's a lot of confetti in here, but for this page, that's where the confetti was living. So I went ahead. This is a page finish. Um, I'm going to put this to the side for a little while because I'm working on some other things. So when I got to the end of page two on this, even though I had originally thought I would keep on working on it until the end of the month for Monogamous May and um, that whole thing, I opted to work on my... Excuse me, 
my Chatelaine because I hadn't touched that yet this month and I realized how much I missed working on it. So, oh, let me show you where I am on this. This is the Desert Mandala Chatelaine. So everything down here is the center part, which I am on hold about while I'm working on this upper vignette. So I had finished this feather, it just needs back stitching. And so since, I think it's the 20th, hang on one second, let me check. Yeah, since the 20th of May, I've been working on this. There are a lot of hours in this. Now granted, I haven't done a ton of stitching in the evenings because I'm working on a knitting deadline, but this is still a ton of stitching. So I have completed this block all the way over to this pillar of stone. So everything from here over is done. The clouds, um, these rock formations. So I have a little bit left to do of the clouds and then I've got this larger rock formation to finish. Finished up the border. Sorry, I am sort of out of room here in my little corner. I wanted to show you guys a closer up. So these little blocks right here that are backstitched, there will be um, square treasures in those, little iridescent treasures that live in each of those in the corners. And that's true for each of the um, vignettes. Um, I'll show you that tree which is just done with long stitches for the like Joshua tree type branches and prickers. And the uh, rock formations are done in a combination of DMC and hand dyed silks. So I am just absolutely loving how the desert southwest colors of the rock go against this beautiful turquoise sky. I just think that I, I'm just really, really happy I picked uh, this fabric, which is a 28 count even weave in Calypso from uh, Picture This Plus. Okay, so the plan for this is to work on this until I get this vignette completely done, which I'm hoping actually might happen today. We'll see, I've got some loose threads on the back. Um, if I get this finished and I have a little bit more time, I'm going to go in and there's a triangular shaped um, section right here. So I think I'll go, try to get that border done if I can get this completed before the end of the month. Um, and I may also try to get the feather back stitched so that's completely done as well. The way that this clue is set up, um, this section and the rattlesnake that's over here in kind of like a corner square that sits right in here are on the same page. But at this point, since I'm jumping around so much to see if I can get this upper part finished before I move on um, and move the scroll frames, um, I think what I might do next time I pick this up well, I'm torn. I don't know. I'm trying to decide if I should work, just work completely up, get to that top border and like start putting that in. Or since I've got this feather done and there are feathers in like each of the corners, they sort of create like a, almost a border um, that parallels this vignette border. Um, this one has the jackrabbit over here. So I was thinking maybe I would do that, but I think it would make more sense to go this way because there are a fair amount of beads in these two small vignettes. And I don't think there's many, if any, beads up here. So if I finish this section and did the upper border, then I could roll it, uh, roll the fabric up just once. Does that make sense? It sounds rambly to me, but anyway, maybe it's totally clear. So this is what I'm working on. Um, for now, I'll do another update when I see you guys in a couple of weeks just to show you kind of what I got done on that and hopefully then I'll have made my mind up about what the next step will be for this. Not sure when I'll pick this up again, but it still will probably be sometime in June. Um, so my plan once I finish that, the Chatelaine, 
for the end of the month is then I'm going to jump over and I'm going to work on my Six of Swords. You might remember how page one looked. See, I just have this left to do to finish page, page one. You guys, I can so do that in the month of June, right? Yeah, I can do it. So that will be the next thing I work on, and I'll work on that until I get a page finish, and then we'll see what I pick. Um, like I said, Chatelaine will come back out sometime in June, but beyond that, I'm not sure. There'll probably be a third project that I work on in that in that month of June. Um, okay, so talked about all of those. Let's see if I have the Six of Swords here to easily show you. I don't think I do. Hang on one second. I know it's been a while since you guys have seen that one, so... Um, nope. Must be downstairs with the rest of my stuff. So I'll bring, I'll bring the whole picture to show you. Um, but I'll put a link down below. It's a heaven and earth charted design artwork by Stephanie Law. So if you want to go check it out, um, on the heaven and earth site, you can do that, but it's also part of her tarot series. Okay. Last little tidbit, um, is some progress that I've made on my epic sewing project. So I think I told you guys last time that I finished up my chemise and I still do not have the handwork done. I have very odd fingers and I had, I have found over the course of my sewing career since I was a little kid, one thimble that works for me and now I can't find it. Um, so I still have not finished the tacking down the facing or putting the, um, there's little pearl buttons that live right here. This is a fake placket. It doesn't actually have buttons. So I have to kind of whip stitch that in place when I tack the, and tack the buttons on right here. Um, but I did kind of want to show you guys like a close up of the white on white striped fabric. It's like a seersucker almost. So I thought that would be kind of nice and cool. And then it's got this little just basic eyelet for the neckline opening. So that is finished. That is done. Um, still needs a good press, but since it's folded up waiting on me to put the buttons on it, I thought, well, we'll just do that when I get it done done because it's going to sit like this for a while. Uh, so then the next thing that I decided to work on was the corset and I went ahead and put together a muslin. Um, most of it fit pretty good, but I have to do some surgery to the bust dart area, um, which I pinned. I put it, pinned it on myself. Um, actually last weekend when my, last weekend, last weekend. When my husband was home, he helped me because it's really hard to fit stuff to yourself. But at any rate, I have that ready to go once I make these. I also needed to take in at the hips a little bit. I was actually really surprised because in my entire life since I hit puberty, I've never had to, to take in the bust. So this pattern is, I think, fairly generous um, in that respect. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark this carefully, re-sew it, and then measure out on the pattern what I did. Um, I mean, obviously these are just pinned temporarily. I need to, um, scooch the seam over so that it lays flat. That's not even showing you anything. Okay. Um, but anyway, so here it is. Um, it also, I think, is going to be just fine in terms of the length from here down to the hip length. Um, which also surprised me because I almost always have to shorten things. So, um, you know, I was really pretty amazed, actually, that it fit as well as it did because... A lot of times, you know, for something that you're fitting to your exact shape, there's no ease in it. You're, it's not like a t-shirt where, you know, this is extra fabric here, right? 
I mean, it has to fit like a glove. Um, so then when I get this completely set, I will then go ahead and cut the heavy cutile outside to match any of the adjustments that I made on this. So I know I will get it right on the first time that I cut it. Um, so that is where I am on that section of it. And then I did bring, excuse me, as I lean outside of the camera, um, I did bring the stuff to show you what I'm making for the actual garment. So this is gonna be the top. It's a jacket style bodice, um, hook and eye closure up the front so it, the, it just meets seamlessly here. Love this shirt waist appearance. And then I'm making a two layer um, bottom. So this will be the uh, underskirt, if you will. It won't be the petticoat. This will be made out of fabric that the light of day will see. There are petticoats to go underneath this to help create this form. Haven't decided yet whether I'm gonna do a true bustle or make something that's sort of a horsehair supported tiered um, petticoat for it. We'll see. Um, I have thoughts about both. Um, like a wire bustle would be more period correct but if it's something that I want to wear more than a couple hours and wear out someplace what I have learned from past experience assisting people wearing these like actresses in period dramas most most public restrooms today you can't it into the stall and actually use the restroom with this on with a wire bustle it just you can't pick the skirts up high enough unless you have help which is absolutely ridiculous so I'm thinking I may lean towards the petticoat version because that at least it's still a lot of fabric but it's crushable and you can make it work a little more easily so this will be the underskirt and then this is going to be the um, waterfall drape that goes down the back. And I'm, I'm using this, this version here that has like almost the two layers of drapes to it as opposed to the semi pleated pointed front version there. I like the waterfall effect better than the ruched effect. So for these, I'm going to do this section and this out of one fabric and then I'm going to do the solid piece and the underskirt out of a different fabric and so here's what I got um, again these items are from the renaissancefabrics.net um, website so I have this this is going to be the center front of that jacket and this is going to be the overskirt um, it's got a really nice drape. It's lightweight. I think it will um, sit in those pleats and the little waterfall effect really nicely, really prettily. And it's very period because remember this is the era where Queen Victoria and her family in the 1880s, they, had, they were at um, Balmoral and all of that sort of Scottish Highland feel. Um, but I didn't want some of the crazy... 1880s they actually there were some crazy crazy print fra fabrics out there like ones with large like life-size chickens printed on them not me um and then this fabric will be the underskirt and the jacket itself it's a very fine herringbone stripe so these will be the two items together And I think that there is enough leeway with these that I could dress it up, dress it down, make it a little, I mean, it's still always gonna be day. It's not an evening wear outfit, but that's fine. Um, that's not what I wanted. Um, 
I think there is some room for doing some steampunk stuff if I had to, if I wanted to not have like quite such a traditional skirt and wanted to do something that you could wear with black combat boots, you could do it. Um, but yeah, I thought these were really fun together and really pretty reasonable considering I bought, um, they actually had to cut me two pieces of this, but I have six yards of this, skirts take a lot, and three yards of this. Um, pretty reasonable for nine yards of fabric, I thought. Um, so at some point I'll do something different with the silk I have and that maybe that at some point will be an evening dress piece or something. I don't know. I haven't decided yet what to do with it. I only have two yards, so it would have to be something like just part of a bodice or just part of an overdrape. Um, so anyway, I think that is it for me today. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. I'm always happy to answer comments um, down below. You can always also message me uh, via YouTube or um, you can contact me via my website, www.wollywonkafiber.com. The last thing I guess I should mention, which I'll talk about more um, as it gets official, um, I will, instead of just to be attending Stitches SoCal, um, which is in Pasadena, the first weekend in November, um, I am actually going to be teaching there. I have nine hours of classes that they have picked up. So um, as soon as those go live on their website, I will let you guys know the specifics about those. If you're somebody in that area and wants to come take a class, a uh, class from me, there's plenty of classes, but a class for me, you can now do that. Um, there's one in particular that I'm teaching that's on color theory that is applicable for not just knitters, it's knitters, spinners, quilters, stitchers, um, anybody who's just interested in combining different colors of things together. And we're going to talk about ways to feel confident in your color decisions. So um, the other class I'm teaching is split up over two days and it's a inspired Fair Isle class where we're going to develop some of our own Fair Isle, Fair Isle patterns, do some swatching, um, talk about ways that you can create your own color palettes. So two kind of fun classes that have to do a lot with color. Uh, again, more information as we get a little closer to that and then the classes become available on the Stitches website. So I hope that you guys have a great rest of your week, great rest of May. I will talk to you sometime mid-June. And so until then, happy crafting. Take care.